All right, so um, a lot of you guys probably saw a time shift the first time it was demoed at, I believe, uh, Demo Night 2, 3? Yeah, yeah, it was a while back. So you may, you may recognize this game, or you may not, uh, given the pretty dramatic changes it's going, undergone. Uh, so Ben is here to talk a little bit about uh, how they took the game, reworked the, pretty much everything, and uh, made it into the game it is today. So, yes. come on up. <laughs> um, actually, it's going to be a little bit more about marketing video games in general, using time shift and its uh, delay, various delays as an example of how it's done. And also, just as an interesting fact, I took this picture um, while sticking my hand out the window of a gypsy cab in St. Petersburg, Russia. <laughs> so this kind of stuff just happens all the time there. Yes, he is on an accordion, yeah, 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 okay. So, um, marketing video games, mainly, now, when we went around the room before, a lot of people were talking about design and art and sound and graphics, but nobody said they wanted to market video games. So even though it's an incredibly important part of the process, it's not as glitzy or glamorous, um, and the reason is that because when it's done well, you don't really notice it. So we're going to go into that a little bit more today. So video game development and marketing is more important than you think. If a game comes out that isn't marketed well, you're not going to hear about it, and you're probably not going to play it, so the developer won't make more games, and that's going to create a negative cycle. Um, so the way that this is handled is that ideally in the process, you want to have uh, marketing, or at least someone with a marketing perspective on board from the beginning to help guide the project towards an eventual way to package and ship it. So if you come up with a game that says, you're jumping from building to building, punching out rabbis. Someone from marketing will probably say, probably not the best way to go. Um, and then you can kind of, you know, fine tune that way. So the way that marketing campaigns are set up is that they're designed to do two things um, primarily. First is to make the audience aware of the product and make sure that they know it even exists so that, you know, before they want to buy it. And make the audience excited about the product. Once you have those two things and the awareness and the excitement level are pretty high, then your marketing campaign should relatively be successful. And so what you want to do is figure out what audience you're talking to first to make you know, them aware of it and excited. If you're marketing your game to the wrong people, then your audience will just never hear of it. So your audience is composed of uh, a couple groups of gamers. You have the casual gamer, who's someone who's a little bit, you know, average person, plays a, a game every once in a while. You have your mainstream gamer, uh, a couple of us. <laughs> may have been this guy a little while ago. He'll play Spider-Man and Sonic and Rugrats, which sold 7 million copies, um, and other types of games. You have your hardcore gamer, which uh, <laughs> a few of us might identify with a little bit more. And then you have your non-gamer, which is uh, someone who's mainly going to buy games for someone else or doesn't know what they're doing and they're in the wrong store. <laughs> so talking about uh, video game marketing, to the golden years a while ago, you're talking about the early Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and Sega Genesis. So you had a limited avenues to reach an audience, basically. You had TV ads, which would reach mainstream gamers and non-gamers. Did you see the latest Nintendo newsletter? Whoa, nice graphics. I'd like to get my hands on that game. You mean you haven't played it yet? We can play it on my Nintendo Entertainment System. It's the Legend of Zelda, and it's really rad. Those creatures from Ganon are pretty bad. Octorok Tech Tech's Libras, too. But with your help, our hero pulls through. Yeah, go Link, yeah, get some. Awesome. Intense. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Your parents help you hook it up. The Legend of Zelda sold separate. So, uh, back then you had TV ads and game magazine coverage and, and ads and, and uh, magazines as well for the hardcore gamers. Like this. <laughs> Uh, casual game audiences, as we know, uh, didn't exist back then, so not a whole love for them, sorry. So basically back then, that, those were the only two real ways to reach your audience, were either TV ads or video game coverage ads like that. There wasn't a whole lot of breakthrough coverage in the mainstream media or something called the internet. But now present day, we have many more avenues for these things that come out. We do have TV ads to reach mainstream and non-gamers, um, as well as game magazine ads for the hardcore. So they've kind of adapted a little bit more. They've become a little bit more user friendly for the, ma uh, the mass market. Uh, we have also uh, tons of internet uh, game sites for coverage ads. You can skin entire websites. 
you have internet viral and astroturfing campaigns. Astroturfing campaigns um, means to kind of create an artificial grassroots campaign. So something like the Sony PSP ad campaign that didn't go over that well uh, would be an example of that. You have ARGs like I Love Bees and all the efforts to propagate Halo's, uh, Halo 2 and Halo 3's advertising campaign. So basically you have infinitely more avenues today to con convey your marketing message than you're used to. So then this will, um, let's see, occasionally you'll come up with developers that think, well, a good game is all you really need. You don't really need to put that much effort uh, or spending into marketing. Uh, yeah, but occasionally there will be a breakthrough success. And this sentiment is usually share, uh, shared by independent developers who can say, well, just, you know, all we can do to make it big is just make the best damn game we can do and the big, uh, the big boys can go do their thing. So occasionally we'll have a breakthrough success like Guitar Hero um, or Katamari Damacy, which costs relatively little, had barely any or, or very little marketing campaigns and managed to succeed just on the merits of the gameplay alone to become huge uh, mega franchises. But then, of course, you have the games and the game developers that didn't heed this warning, uh, which were critically acclaimed and yet poorly sold, such as Psychonauts, Grim Fandango, Oddworld Stranger's Wrath, and Beyond Good and Evil. And all these games came out and received excellent reviews, but were not selling well at all due to all sorts of issues, mainly because they didn't have enough of a marketing presence. Which brings us to Time Shift, which is the game that I'm working on right now uh, at the independent developer Saber Interactive. So, very brief history to catch it up. It was announced in 2005 by Atari when it was being published. It looked a little bit like that. Uh, it was picked up by Vivendi in 2006, and it was delayed a year to 2007, and now that is the new logo. So, the process of this year-long delay and basically re reinventing this game is pretty intensive. So you would say, why would someone do this anyway? The game was almost done. It was famously seven bugs from completion until Vivendi said, well, let's, let's give it more time. So why would someone do this? Um, basically, it wasn't resonating with the audience that it was going to come out with, and the marketing messages were conflicted. This was a screenshot of the old version. It's a little hard to tell what's going on, a lot of vibrant colors, a lot of weird-looking enemies and weapons. So you might not quite understand what it is. Now, I have an old trailer here. This game has not yet been rated. Well done, there you go. So just imagine some, some sounds even cooler than that if you can. <laughs> you have an idea of what the, what the game looked like about a year ago. That was with the voiceovers and the Yeah, we had... Um, Dennis Quaid and Michael Ironside and Nick Chinlin all signed on and they had, they're, they're, they're really, they were done. They did voiceovers for the script and the game, they were in there, but as part of the overhaul, we realized that it wasn't right for the game either, so we just, you know, cut that out, which is a pretty ridiculous step considering how much they got for it, what they did.